Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. Uh, today I sat down with a new friend of mine. Uh, he's a guy who I was recommended to. I've, uh, I had heard about him in the past through friends of mine, colleagues of mine who've worked with him, and they, they really spoke very highly of him. Um, and he works with a, a plant called San Pedro, or Huachuma, uh, which is a plant that um, I know of, I'm familiar with, but I, I don't have a lot of experience with. So uh, it was a really interesting podcast with me to be able to sit down with him, to connect with him, and, and also to uh, learn a bit about not only the plant, but the work he does, how he does it. Uh, and it was a really fascinating conversation. He's a really, really nice guy, really deep guy, and I, I really enjoyed the conversation. So um, if you're interested in, in, in that plant or just plant medicine in general, um, He's a guy who's been practicing for a number of years, and um, from what I've heard, he, he holds a really beautiful space, and he he's, he's a, just seems like a really wonderful guy, so uh, I think you'll enjoy that. So, um, as always, if you're listening on YouTube or Apple Podcast or whatever you're listening on, uh, hit the subscribe button or follow. That uh, really helps with the algorithms and getting this podcast out there, and, and uh, you know, share the podcast, get it out there. And thank you guys for listening. And again, I hope you enjoy the show. So, uh, cool. So I, I had heard of you, I think first through Alan, probably Alan's yeah. a mutual friend of ours. Uh, we, we work together at Temple of Way of Light and he also does work with tobacco. Yeah. Um, and it, he told me he started working with you cause he was interested in San Pedro, Huachuma. And yeah. so I'd heard of you that way. And then I, I guess we have some mutual friends here too. Yeah, we do. Um, I've actually never worked with Wachuma. Okay. It's uh, it's one of those plants I've 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 had desire to work with, but I've just never really found the time and the space. Mm. The last number of years, I've just been super focused on on the work I'm doing in the mm. jungle. Mm. Um, so maybe maybe you could talk a little bit about San Pedro. I yeah. I know at one point I, I had a friend and she was doing some work in uh, I think it's called Chivin de Wantard and. Mm-hmm. And I know that's one of the oldest sites in, in Peru, and it has a lot of, uh, I think, history and, and architecture and even mm. archetypes, and, and they think maybe even San Pedro was used there. So. Yeah, I think they found some San Pedro raisin there, uh, remnants. Mm. A lot of pic- pictogram kind of, you know, they were illiterate, but they used pictograms kind of, and so there's a, there's a lot of kind of, pictograms and drawings alluding to San Pedro you know mm-hmm. I don't know I've never I've never been to Chavina I it was it was cool because I had a an anthropologist from the states I forget his name right now but he he came and worked with me because he he was working on Chavin for a long time and through his work yeah he's a very scientific minded guy but he became more and more intrigued with San Pedro as well you know mm-hmm. and so I wanted to experience it I don't know why he came to the valley for that why it didn't work necessarily with it in Chavin um but yeah I mean San Pedro you know as with any medicine I guess it's difficult to summarize but for me it's really you know as as everyone says it's medicine of the heart uh that's kind of its special speciality you know I think one of the things that I really uh appreciate the most of San Pedro is that its entry point tends to be a little bit more accessible, a little bit more gentle than, let's say, ayahuasca. Obviously, there's there's outliers. You know, some people can have <coughs> pretty big first experiences. Um, that and so the approach isn't as steep um, as with some other 
plant medicines. And then secondly, for me, the big thing is really that it just really provides you with so much time and space. It really, it's a very long-lasting medicine, and it also dilates time. So you 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 find yourself having this day outside of time, um, mm. where you get to really commune with yourself and with parts of yourself. You know that maybe we haven't before had the time or the ability to really spend, you know, time with giving it attention, you know. Mm. And so it really allows like an open encounter with aspects of ourselves um, that seek expression and attention. Mm. And in that way, for me, it's very much a somatic experience. It's very body-based, um, emotional-based. You know, they, they, a lot of different things can happen. You can have visual states occur same as with ayahuasca but it because we do it in the day it tends to be you know if it's a lighter experience you can be quite externally focused so there can be a lot of bridging and connecting to mountains nature um when it's a bit stronger it tends to be more internally focused really focused on the emotional expression that which Mm. the heart desires for us to feel Basically, for me, it's almost like completing um, uncomplete expressions or reactions from the past, be mm. it related to trauma or be it related to pretty much anything, really. Mm-hmm. And then from that perspective, kind of helping us to to see it from a different perspective, to see the gifts that it possibly brings. With that, because it creates a lot of time or it creates a lot of space as well, there is more room at times for some therapeutic and it's not like I'm going to go and sit and th- do therapy necessarily with someone, but there's space for some engagement mm. with people. And that can be very, very useful for me, you know, um, in just helping someone to express verbally as well um, what's going on and have some time and space to really reframe things for themselves. Mm. Um, so, you know, my approach to San Pedro at first wasn't really informed by, you know, I was I was curious about it. We'd first started working with ayahuasca as well. Uh, we is my wife and I. It was back mm. in 2007. And so, you know, I had a reason for coming to, some pe- uh, to ayahuasca. I'd had depression for many years from medical trauma. So I knew what it was, seemingly, that I was depressed about. But despite years of therapy and meds, it just really wasn't going anywhere. You know, you know, the meds kind of helped suppress certain symptomatic aspects of it, helped me be a little bit more functional mm-hmm. in society. But uh, I was still essentially depressed. I didn't feel anything. Mm-hmm. And that just wasn't acceptable for me anymore. And so reading about ayahuasca in National Geographic Travelers magazine, an article by Kira Salak, 2006, mm-hmm really piqued my interest something inside of me said hey go and look go look at this and so you know back then there was less information than now Mm. online but all the anecdotal reports i i could get was very indicative that you know aya could be a very good uh, medicine or route to use for depression and so you know both my wife and i came to peru to the jungle uh, in 2007 and we did a retreat with five ceremonies and um, it was great. It was brilliant. I mean, it, it, it was extremely traumatizing for me. <laughs> My first ceremony was immensely powerful. Mm. Um, you worked with Shipibo? No, I worked with Paleros. So uh-huh. I worked at a place called Blue Morpho. Because oh, yeah. um, that, that was the place that was basically where the article was written mm. about. And so because we didn't know anything about you know ayahuasca world and so forth we decided to just go with them you know mm-hmm. and uh yeah it was good i mean uh, blue morpho you know at that point i think had a certain approach and i'm not gonna be unhappy about that approach because i think it was in the end of the day extremely helpful for me but it seemed like the first ceremony they kind of gave everyone a massive dose irrespective yeah. <laughs> and it just so happened that I'd, you know, without knowing it, I was extremely sensitive to, to plant medicines. Um, but I guess I got the experience that I needed. You know, it was, it was immense. It was hell. Um, 
But it did break open a quite a number of things. And so it took, took me about a year to integrate that experience. But the remnant of that was every time I went back to ayahuasca, because I was like, all right, this is great. It created a big opening. It cracked through a few things, but my work's not done. You know, I'm, I'm essentially, I, don't, I didn't feel depressed anymore. Mm-hmm. But I knew that the, the thinking, there was more layers to it than that, you know, that if I left it at that place, I'd probably over time get depressed again. Mm-hmm. And so perhaps not to the same level, but who knows? You know, I just had the sense that I needed to do quite a bit more work. So we went back and drank more ayahuasca. But because of that first experience, essentially, um, I'd enter into Aya with so much terror, you know, mm. And there was more work that it wanted to do related to trauma. You know, my trauma was um, that my heart stopped. I had a cardiac arrest during surgery for scoliosis. And so there was death energy around and so forth. And for whatever reason it was, it was so overwhelming every time that I just shut down. Is that something you... You remember? You were aware of that No, experience? I mean, I was in surgery. I was under mm. anesthetic. So I didn't have the, the tunnel with the light at the end mm. kind of experience. It was just, you know, so from a mental perspective, I had no memory, you know. Uh, they had to shut down the surgery. As I started straightening my back, putting in the first metal rod to straighten it, there was going to be two. And my back was, I think, 97 degrees curvature at that point. So they straightened it to something like, 20-something degrees. And because of that, it, it stimulated the vagus nerve, which mm-hmm. suppressed the heart. And so they had to kind of, you know, put my muscles back in, turn me around and start recess. Yeah. And so I don't remember any of that because I was under, under anesthetic. Uh, so mentally, there wasn't any recollection. But obviously, my body was holding a lot of trauma, all sorts of related energies, death kind of stuff and so forth. And so, you know, these are, because I'd, I'd been on meds and I'd been in the, with, with a psychiatrist and a psychologist for many years. And so you know, I was quite adept at talking about it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, from the perspective of looking at it now, what I realize is that, you know, doing some TRE or any body-based, somatic-based trauma release therapy would have probably been very necessary in combination. Mm-hmm. But at that point, that just wasn't, part of what people did, uh, at least in South Africa where I was, you know, that, that wasn't known about. And so, you know, I, uh, as these kind of things arose and as, I guess, soul retrieval kind of things arose, it would just be so intense for me, so overwhelming that I kind of shut down from fear. And so I ended up doing at that point over the next two years or so about 30 ay- ayahuasca ceremonies, wow. yeah. Uh, on retreats so we'd come to South America do a retreat and then we traveled South America for a year and we did a dieta in the jungle and so forth but I could never find myself able to surrender or relax to the medicine from that Mm. first ceremony there was just this I'd go into it with so much fear already Mm. and so we end up in the Sacred Valley or in Cusco and uh, we hear about San Pedro so I'm like all right you know let's let's give it a try um, do some Pedro ceremony. Same, also very hard, but the shutdown isn't com- isn't absolute. Mm. There's way more wiggle room. Immense fear shows up and everything, but there's way more wiggle room. So if I had to be honest, you know, at that point I kind of went in the direction or the root of San Pedro more out of a desire to continue healing and finding that I could actually... I had a little bit more room to be with a fear in a more effective way than with I am, yeah? And so it wasn't really that the San Pedro was calling. Both medicines approaching them, I always felt like I was, I was, I was like a cow being led to the abattoir, you know? It's like um, immense stress, uh, diarrhea before ceremony, all these kinds of things. But somehow I kept going with the San Pedro because it, it just felt, it, 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 it felt more appropriate for what I was working with at that point. And so we had decided that we wanted to move back to Peru. Really also more around medicine work. I'd said to my wife at that point that, you know, I wasn't willing to come once a year for a retreat. It was going to take too long. 
I was like, let's move here for a year or two. You can always go back, work again, both in corporate at that point. Mm-hmm. And, um, but let's see how it is. Let's see if we can live here for a year, if we can live here. Maybe we start a business here. Maybe we start a bed and breakfast or a bistro or something. We both like cooking. So, um, But basically, we ended up here and uh, started working with San Pedro. And that was kind of like an ongoing thing, you know. So we, we'd, we'd work with it quite frequently for a number of months and then take a break. Uh, maybe go back home to visit family for a, for two months or whatever. Come back here. We didn't do anything for income. We'd uh, we'd had a house that we owned in South Africa that we'd sold, and so that kind of funded us. Mm. And so over the, that following two and a half three years, basically, I'd done a dieta with San Pedro, and it was really after the dieta that I'd experienced my first shift with it, mm. from kind of using it still in a careful way towards um, starting to relax and be able to surrender way more to it. And so there was, there was quite a bit of deepening that happened at that point. And so, yeah, you know, from that perspective, I never, I, I can't really say that there was a conscious choice before that to choose San Pedro because it was calling me. It just felt like the more appropriate thing. Yeah. After that shift, though, I continued working. At that point, the depression was long gone. But we just became so focused on self-discovery and inner work and clearing more things that are coming up that it was actually a very beautiful time, very carefree. Mm. Um, No responsibilities outside of that which I chose my inner process to be. And the same for my wife. It was a very, very beautiful time of growth. Yeah, and it was around there, uh, around 2012, that one of the mentors that I'd work, been working with, one of the my guides who also I consider good friends of mine, Paul Temple and Suzanne and PSAC, Paul, Tem- Paul uh, after one ceremony, kind of out of the blue spoke to me and said, hey, you, you can consider serving medicine. You hold a nice energy with it. And I was like, what, what, what are you talking about? I haven't done an apprenticeship. And he was like... No, not a classic apprenticeship, but with San Pedro, you know, you've you've done enough work and just don't make the mistake of becoming the teacher. And I was like, okay, you know, if if you decide to do it. And I kind of toyed with the idea for a month or two and then did a few ceremonies just for friends, uh, just to just to feel it out and everything in my heart, everything in my in my body, in my in my being was just like, yes, this is it. Mm. I was scared as hell, though. <laughs> I was like, who am I <laughs> you know, to do this? Also, in the back of my mind, it was this thing, you know, we'd, along the way, we kind of started thinking about the idea, not to serve medicine, but to work with people. Mm. Initially, my idea was to work with people around them working with others. So kind of as an integration uh, place and... and uh, person you know so having kind of like a a place that caters good food and where where you can come and be during work with someone else or after or before but um yeah you know the, the thing that was stressful for me was still this idea that hey i needed to have a lineage behind me i needed to have a teacher i needed to have someone where i could get some direct teachings about certain practicalities I mean we've done a lot of ceremonies and so you learn a lot through that but you know there was no transmission of ceremonial knowledge no holding according to Paul you know he was like just let the medicine show you the way and so I started doing that and sure enough over the last few years or the last seven years it's been a continuous uh, journey of learning mm-hmm. um for me, I hope that never stops. <laughs> so, San Pedro, yeah, you know, with retrospect, I think if there's severe body-based trauma, I do think San Pedro for some or most people with very severe... I've met in the interim so many people who had similar experiences than me with ayahuasca, yeah. where it would be almost overwhelming shutdown would happen too strong 
you know, again, one could say maybe they were working in a style that wasn't a, the perfect style, the most appropriate style for that, because I know with ayahuasca you can work in a more gentle way as well. Um, and I still, you know, I'm not saying this with any negativity towards ayahuasca. Huge respect for that medicine, for that plant. It's, it's amazing. I don't think I could have done the work that I did with San Pedro if it wasn't for ayahuasca. Mm. Um, even even if it was traumatizing for me, you know, it's 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 an incredible uh, plant and um, incredible people, you know. So huge respect, but it feels like the way that San Pedro kind of brings the content can sometimes be easier for people to engage with. Mm-hmm. So I think for that kind of trauma and related depression, um, for a lot of people, I reckon San Pedro might be. Um, or a combination, but some San Pedro work might be very beneficial. Mm-hmm. So San Pedro is is the the, the Christianized name, the, the Spanish yes. name, and yes. Wachuma is the the Quechua name. Is the Quechua name, and Wachuma mm-hmm. means something like being without a head, and so you interesting know, because it's it's so body and heart. You know, it doesn't mean your mind gets switched off completely at higher doses. Mm-hmm. You know, mind's disarmed. Um, very much of an embodied somatic experience and so I, I get why they call it Wachuma mm. yeah San Pedro Saint Peter so I mean he's said to be holding the keys to heaven no? so okay. um, the story is that when the Spaniards arrived the guys working with San Pedro at that point tried to you know keep it in in uh, acceptability mm. with the importation of Christianity I don't think that worked Essentially, that's why with San Pedro you get very few intact older lineages uh, um, surviving. You know, there are lineages of people who are still working with it, spe- specifically up in the north of Peru. Um, and uh, some people connect to the Chavin lineage, but then it's it's more of a spiritual lineage. It's not like a guy from Chavin teaching you. You know that that culture hasn't existed for a while. Mm. Um, so it's much less lineage based in, in in any case in general than what I is you know you might find one or two or three lineages not as old again import a lot of christian elements and so forth but um and is that is that because they've they've just somehow been lost or yeah, they've I think, been I think the, with I think the modern? Spaniard the, the the Spanish effect was that a lot of the people probably just just dropped it or mm-hmm. Or, or left um, or it was eradicated in some way I mean I don't know this isn't really part of as far as I can see some written history or so but it makes more sense for me because I mean the Spaniards were very active in the Andes um, you know in the jungle there's just so far you can go you know it's like well, there's so many tribal there's so many tribes and different places different people different cultures that are using ayahuasca in different ways that it was way more likely to kind of survive intact mm-hmm. you know um the the is the the caro people no they don't really use they don't, san okay. pedro no as far as i know no. uh, again everything i say you know i'm this is three years of just hearing other people talk and uh, talking to a lot of Kato people. I've worked with a fair no- amount of Kato people and uh, their work doesn't really seem to include much uh, plant medicines mm-hmm. other than coca, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, I do know there are certain groups who use Vilka, but as far as I'm, I'm aware, they tend to use that more amongst themselves. Uh, mm. rather than with, let's say, a client or a patient or mm. someone, you know. Again, all this is, is uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a certain amount of ignorance with it, mm. so I might be wrong on any of these counts. Um, and so if people aren't familiar, it, it comes from a particular cactus. Yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's, it's a family of cacti, really. There's, there's quite a number of varietals growing across the Andes from Ecuador to northern Argentina, really, mm. probably in Colombia as well. Um, you know, there's more than 20, 25 different varietals, depending on the oh, region. Wow. Some of them have long thorns, some of them have very 
tiny thorns. So, you know, here it's called Wachuma or San Pedro. They don't really distinguish too much between the different types, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, in the West, you know, what we call San Pedro has a specific te- taxonomy. That's Trichocereus pachinoi. And so that's the one with the really short spines. Mm-hmm. Um, here in the valley, most people use the varietal from Huaraz. And that's actually Peruvian torch. So that's not really even called San Pedro in the West, Western taxonomy. But it, oh. yeah, it's Huachuma. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's all sorts of different varietals. Um, I've had probably about five different types. And really, they've all got essentially the same energy, the same container. And then there's slight personality differences, you know. Some of them can have quite quite more pronounced personality differences, like the Bolivian torch tends to have a much higher alkaloid content of certain alkaloids, which uh, can have the effect be quite... Uh, almost electric, have a little bit of an edge to it on the body, mm. like there's, there's a, lot, a lot more shaking, a lot more kind of tenseness in, in, in the, you know. Again, it's hard to talk about it in this way because, you know, people will say, you look at certain books that have been written on the subject by Ross Heaven, and, you know, again, for me, it's not about wrong or right. Each person has their own connection. Mm. And my experience has not been similar to what has been reported there. So they'll talk about the different number of ribs that a cactus has. Hmm. So they'll warn against certain number of ribs. I've had everything from 6 up to 13. And all of them incredible medicine. It's just different frequencies. Um, there's not one really that I'd avoid. I probably wouldn't use cactuses above 10 for first timers because the frequency is just different. It feels like you'd, I'd ideally want to have someone have a bit more of a feel for the cactus's energy before going to the higher. Otherwise, it, it just feels like it's not going to be connected to. But again, you know, that's kind of my sense with the Wachuma is that it presents us with this incredibly wide spectrum of ways to work with it, of different ways to connect to it and to use it as well. And so... I think this is also because there's not so many lineages. It's not like used in a very, very specific, narrow way. Mm. And so a lot of people use it as a medicine, but they bridge other methodologies with mm. it. Some people will use therapeutic approach more. Um, some people will use slightly lower doses, but then do combine it with walking, mm. connecting to mountains, to lakes. Um, some people will use it in the evening some people will use it in the day Um, and I think it does lean itself to that way you can't really come to it from the perspective of no, that's that's wrong, this is better each one has its own special medicine that it brings the person so I think it's more dependent on what you're really wanting to get you know, what you'd like to heal and what your intention is to decide what's more appropriate for what you need you know Mm -hmm way that I work with it is I work with it in my property that has been created and set up for ceremonies. I like that because it's a container. Um, I don't always feel very comfortable drinking out. I like working a certain way with the plant, and so having people feel like they're in a protected space where it's safe to be vulnerable, where it's mm-hmm. where there's permission to um, express even externally um, where the whole space is dedicated to that, you know, um, it feels very appropriate for the way that I'm that I like to work with it. But that's my way, and so I'd always be very careful to say, you know, this is the only way to work with it. I think with Aya, there's, it seems very well suited to the way that it's typically traditionally used. Mm. Uh, where with Wachuma, it feels like there's a little bit more leeway. In a way, it almost feels, and this might be a totally ridiculous thing to say, but it almost feels like it, the, the, the plant is, is not pleased, but happy with the fact that there's less strict lineages around. Mm. Um, it does do well in a good container, mm-hmm. but it feels like that that container needs to some, be something that's very authentic to the person mm. that is working with it. So my connection would dictate how that specific container would look 
someone else's connection would dictate how their connection would look. Mm -hmm. And so there's a deepening, as with any plant, if you work with it over a long period of time, you generate a very nice connection to it. And that kind of, for me, is the guiding framework. If we can stay authentic and if we can stay in alignment with that, with that connection and keep it pure, keep it aligned, that will dictate how you can work with it. And whatever way that is, then, for me, feels like it would be good. It would be appropriate. And there would be very beautiful healing flowing from that, you know. Mm. You mentioned this idea, and I've heard this before, this idea that, that it really works on the level of the heart. Mm. If I, I'm sure some people understand what that means, but if, if that's kind of foreign to someone, what is yeah. that? Yeah, I, mean? I wouldn't say level of the heart. I think body level, somatic level. I mean, again, it works across all levels, you know. But that seems to be where it tends towards. And so, But for me, it brings the consciousness of the heart. And what I mean by that, you know, is like... I always, I always uh, have a chuckle at myself or at people, you know. Very often I hear people say, oh, yeah, we'll talk process. And someone will be like, oh, I'm so bad at forgiveness. I'm so bad at acceptance. And, I'm, you know, I've, I've sat with that for so long. And I don't think anyone's really bad with that. I just think we use the wrong place of, of consciousness, the wrong intelligence to do that. We try and forgive at times or accept with our minds. We try and, you know... I don't think that's what the mind's for. Um, that intelligence and that is already there. It's already present in our hearts. I just think culturally, most of the first world, we've become so... Uh, we do feel, but we've become kind of atrophied in the, in the capacity of the heart and the capacity of the body and the gut to express feelings. We've become very mistrustful of very deep expression of feeling. You know? mm. It's not necessarily that the feeling's the truth. But in, 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 in the way that I approach it for healing, it feels like it's about expressing it. So it's not about believing what the feeling says. In fact, it's better, in, better but it's, it's, it's probably more beneficial to not think about it at all, <laughs> if we can. So really to just get into presence and communion with a raw energy as it's expressing in the body. You don't have to wallow in it. You can just be present with it so you can almost connect to the space in which it's occurring and just allow it to express in the way it wants. Mm -hmm. Sometimes quite guttural sounds might show up, movements, shaking. But it's very embodied, very strong emotional reaction. You know? mm -hmm. So you get this beautiful... And by all means, this is not what everyone experiences the whole time. But when you're having something like, let's say, a trauma or a previous unresolved or uncompleted emotional response, the San Pedro really helps us to, to get that to flow, mm. you know, and it gives us time to allow that to flow. And so we can kind of, at first, just really connect to it in a kind of aesthetic, somatic level. And then as, we, as, it, as it flows and as it expresses and as there's space and capacity to start seeing it, I'm not talking about mental seeing, but seeing and holding it from a different perspective than what we traditionally do. Then the heart kind of steps in with this capacity of all the heart-based intelligence, forgiveness, acceptance, acknowledgement. There's so much space for me in the heart. And so even if there's an aspect of the mind that's resistant or judgmental towards this energy, because it might be associating it with, uh, let's say, there was sexual trauma with the event and how unacceptable that was. So the mind holds the narrative and says, no, this is bad. I don't want to feel this. Almost, mind almost seems to feel like it's going to be re-traumatizing. Mm -hmm. And the body's like, no, this is not about that. It's not about going back to the event. It's about allowing the event to clear out of the body. And the only way that can happen in a way, if it's held in a certain way in the body, is for it to be felt and expressed in that way. It's almost like a wave holding a lot of kinesthetic energy and it's almost like we're able to hold this wave static. And so now it's sitting there and its, it's potential is never being expressed. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to keep it static. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of control. There's a lot of contraction happening. And at first it might be wise even to do so because we might be of an age or in a circumstance where we don't have the maturity or the resources to 
stay stable, stay grounded and allow this expression. It might absolutely, you know, bring us to a breakdown or we might not be supported enough or not feel supported enough. So now, later, you can come to a place where you, it's almost like knowing that if it's arising now, the conditions inside of me are probably appropriate so that I can allow this to happen without destroying me. Mm -hmm. And so this expression then makes space for not a reframing, but an integration and a deeper understanding. And then that's what the, the gifts that it brings as we accept and forgive and come to a higher understanding and appreciation of what this actually brought us. Essentially for me, it's about understanding the experience of being human in a very, very deep way by being it. Mm -hmm. It's not about cognitive understanding. It's as simple as saying, well, you know, you don't have to eat a peach. I'll explain to you how it is to eat a peach. You're never going to be able to con conceptualize what it is to eat a peach or to have an orgasm. And so in a similar way, the only way we can experience being human is to experience it in an embodied way. And I think for most of us, because of collective trauma, uh, ancestral trauma, lifetimes of essentially sleepwalking, that we're this, this medicine but other methodologies that help us embody or just our process of embodiment is really the, the, the key for me here because it helps us to start experiencing life from the embodied first-hand naked experience of it. It's not taking us, the mind kind of takes us meta to it and looks at it from a safe distance and says, okay, I'm going to figure it out. You know, I've, 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 I, know, I, know, I understand. You can't understand it until you, you have it happen here. You can see it fully and you can allow the expression to complete. And so for me, San Pedro is really a beautiful tool, especially for the consciousness of this time that we're in. It feels like embodiment, at least for me, and I imagine so for a lot more people. It feels like embodiment such an important aspect, the deepening of embodiment, the deepening of embracing, um, experiencing life firsthand in life, being life itself without this buffer that the mind kind of creates, saying, no, let's look at it from a safe distance. It's mm -hmm. too risky, mm -hmm. you know. I think you know, for, for many people who, who are raised in these traditions, I mean, what you're saying makes a lot of sense, or people who've worked with, plant, you know, plant medicine, as we yeah. call it. But for so many people, you know, I would imagine that seems like such a foreign concept. I mean, so many people, when their idea of medicine is you know, a pill that I take because yeah. I have a problem and, and yeah. then hopefully the problem goes away or it's regulated somehow. Yeah. Why do you think in so many places these these traditions that you're speaking of, this way you're speaking of, is kind of absent? I mean, because for many people, mm -hmm. you know, again, this work is really spreading. You know, there's a lot more information, as you said, first 20 years ago or 10 years ago. But why do you think in so many places that's kind of absent? You know, it's very foreign to many people. I think, for, at least for the Western culture, you know, where we come from, you know, European, American, um, I don't see this as a mistake at all, but I think we went through a certain phase of growth that was perhaps also necessary. I mean, we can judge it and say it wasn't, it's bad, but it happened, and we're still sitting in that worldview, in that narrative, essentially, in the mythology of that, where... A lot of, uh, uh, for whatever reason, you know, I think it, it, people call it the age of reason. And I think that's, that's an important thing to acknowledge and see and acknowledge the aspects inside of ourselves, you know, um, that bring this about. Because it's almost like the softer, the feminine. You know, people are talking a lot about masculine and feminine. And for me, feminine is the more intuitive, the more earthy, the more um, surrendering aspects of the self as well and so it's almost like this imbalance occurred in, 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 in on that level and we started mistrusting anything that wasn't reasonable you know woman and the embodiment of the feminine as the more emotional as the more irrational side of life got kind of discarded as irrational in favor of that which was rational. We started discovering some scientific 
things. We started developing, industrializing. I mean, it goes before that as well. But really, we're sitting at the pinnacle of that right now. Um, you know, the medicines that people... And so, as part and parcel of that, the for me, the shadow element of the masculine that has really come to the forefront, and that is control. And so... When we talk about medicine or drugs, you know, traditionally what we think of is something that's controlling or eff affecting a response inside of our body. I have a headache, so you take something that numbs nerve endings or whatever the mechanism is, you know. You take an antacid, you're eating unhealthy. What we do, we don't change from eating fatty food to eat whole food. We take antacids. So rather than going to the cause or the root of the issue, we control the symptom. And I think that's not necessarily intentional. That I think that's just where we find ourselves because that thinking, bringing more layers of control, this is almost a natural um, outflow of this expression of uh, imbalanced or if you will, shadow masculine archetypal energy, you know. And again, you know, according to me, I'm not saying this is the truth, but as far as I can feel and see, I don't think it was a mistake. Maybe it was a very important aspect of, again, experiencing what that is like, you know, and being able to kind of find ourselves at the, at the limit of that and say, okay, we can't do this anymore. What, what is wrong? And unfortunately, we're reaching that point in society, you know, and I think that a lot of the solutions that the status quo wants to throw is, again, coming from exactly the same consciousness. Let's just add more control on top of what's already happening, and hopefully we'll figure it out. Let's figure out more data points that we can do control more efficiently, and then, you know, we'll sort it out at some point. We haven't started collectively, I think, seeing that this control isn't, bad you know it's coming from an impetus and archetypal energy that has its place in certain situations I, re I reckon but that it's been taken to its absolute extreme and this is why we're finding ourselves where we are mm -hmm. and so you know i think that's that's something for me that's very uh, just, just just necessary to to touch on you know what, what, what was your question i forget now i mean that was that was basically it yeah. um, i mean it seems <laughs> You know, in in, in 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 many cultures along the world, around the world, it seems like as they get developed, there there are certain ailments that are either becoming more prevalent, or there's just yeah. a bigger light that's being shown yeah. on them. Mm -hmm. Things like anxiety and depression, Absolutely. and lack of purpose and yeah. connection, um, and that's really interesting. And so, do you think something like Wachuma, the the, the headless medicine mm. do you think that's kind of a, a remedy or a balance to to bring people more from this sense of rationality control to a place of of, of surrender and letting go because yeah. i mean it is interesting i mean even what we're doing here this would not exist if it wasn't for rationality like yeah, how yeah. does this wire connect and absolutely but at a certain point, like anything, things can become out of balance. Out of so balance or extreme. Bring, you know? right? And so, again, I'm not anti-technology. I'm not anti-allopathic medicine. You know, if my, uh, if my, uh, you know, if, if I have a rupture internally, I'm not going to go and have a guy blow tobacco on me and shake a rattle at me. I'm going to go, <laughs> I'm going to go to the hospital. Um, so I think there, you know, yeah, again, you know, I, th I think there's a place for everything. We've just taken everything. That's why I say I don't think it's a bad thing as well. We've had such an acceleration in the, in the, in, into technology. Unfortunately, a lot of it was because of wars and there was that kind of impetus. But we've developed tools that I believe that in the future we can start using differently. I really have a feeling that there's going to be a massive boom of creativity of technology and new technologies if we actually start using it mostly for peaceful purposes and for the upliftment of humankind, working with nature rather than to subdue nature. Mm -hmm. I really have a sense that we can, there's just going to be so much more um, inventions and creativity around this, you know. But again, yeah, it's, it's you know, so I, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. I just, you know, 
there's a skepticism still, but that's changing. I'm sure you're experiencing the same thing. By no means am I saying it's changing globally. But where it was quite fringe earlier, it's mm. definitely becoming more, if you want, mainstream, mm. more acceptable. Um, I mean, I don't think what Schumer... I think what Schumer is very useful for this, but that it, as a, as a thing, is the answer. Mm. No, I think all shamanic methodologies, all methodologies, and, if you will, technologies that we've forgotten that help us connect to the earth, help us connect to our bodies um, with silence, with intention, with reverence and respect. All plant medicines, really, if used appropriately, I think can be extremely powerful aids towards this. You know, I talk from my experience of where what Schumer for me really, you know, I've, I'm, I studied engineering. I was the most rational linear minded person on it was so rational and linear and i you know plant medicines were extremely challenging for me initially because of that and i still have my mind and it still it still likes thinking about stuff and philosophizing and and i appreciate it for that you know the balance doesn't mean that we become irrational or that we put the mind away in a box um, the mind's still a beautiful thing it's just about balance you know, I let, my mind has many opinions and things to say and uh, ideas and truths. Most of the time I, I practice having that and letting it have that. But the difference for me now is just practicing, realizing that that's not the truth. Mm-hmm. It's just my mind having fun at playing in the realm that it likes playing. And so I give it that time. I also give myself time to sometimes be, to sit and to commune and to just be really with what is, you know, not mm. just be up here in the future or in the past. Or I mean, spiritual teachers have been talking about this for ages, though. No? We can read about it with, as far back as you go, essentially. About, you know, and I think it's the dominance of the mind that creates a certain kind of imprisonment of reason it's not that there's anything wrong with the mind but when we put it on the pedestal and make it God then uh, we become prisoners of it somehow Mm -hmm. because we give it the power of absolute truth Mm -hmm. in our life and I mean you know I like correlating it almost to what's happening in the world right now we've just had this astrological event that shows up you know Pluto and Saturn and Capricorn and the archetypal energy of that is basically structure, authority um, and Pluto and, 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 and Saturn is bringing tumult and bringing and so you can see it I mean I think that's the reason why there's so many conspiracy theories I think that's the reason you know for me conspiracy theory is almost like a myth we don't have to take it as literally true but it's coming from something if we ignore the energy from which it's coming we'll, we'll, we'd be stupid you know mm. I think a certain amount of distrust has been earned from our authority structures our churches our governments pharmaceutical industries um, petrochemical industries there's been lies there's been collusion there's been moneyed interest there's been fudging of good science this is not conspiracy theories you know and so people being you know it gets labeled as anti-science but i think that it's not it's just a little bit of a skepticism starting to arise starting to say but you know we don't really trust what's being reported anymore Mm. and i think that's to a certain extent warranted Mm. now in the same way you know we've always given our energy and authority and power to authority like the government will figure it out they'll protect us they'll help us the scientists will figure it out the doctors the the church will it's the same almost the same mechanism as what we do with our head you know and so having these structures kind of collapse off their pedestal um, for me, is also very symbolic of the of the journey internal the internal journey of this imbalance of reason being everything essentially, mm-hmm. and it dictating through its protection, saying no that that traumatic feeling shouldn't be felt. It's bad for you. Mm-hmm. 
you know, it's not colluding. It truly believes it's helping us. Um, but it's ne not necessarily the absolute truth. So if we can start seeing that, I think that can be very helpful to understand that the mind has its place. But just for me, the mantra has always been like, you know, have your, have your mind say what it says, but just realize that it's probably not true. <laughs> you know? Yeah, there was a lot there. You, you, you mentioned one thing, uh, which I think is really interesting, this idea you're speaking of like a shamanic way of being. And, and you mm -hmm. use these two words, uh, reverence and respect. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems like those, those two qualities are perhaps out of balance, <laughs> mm -hmm. as you were saying. You know, it seems like many people have lost kind of that idea of reverence, you know, mm. a reverence of, you know, or awe. Mm. And, and, and that does seem to be something that kind of shamanic work or plant work has the ability to, to get us back in touch with it. Mm. And, and it seems like often with reverence, there's, there's gratitude that comes with that. There's humility that comes with that. Mm. And, uh, you know, also kind of this idea you were mentioning of authority. And, uh, I, I read a study once and, you know, who knows what studies these days, but um, it was interesting. And it was saying one of the qualities they noticed when people were working with plant medicine and theogenic medicine is that it tended to lead people into a kind of less authoritarian state. They, they described it more as, um, you know, without getting too political, almost more of like a libertarian point of view or a mm -hmm. classical liberal point of view. This mm -hmm. kind of really this idea of not putting so much trust or faith in an authority, but that there's, there's more of a direct experiencing and, and a trust in reality or, or, or the experience itself or in nature. Um, is that is that something you find with with these plants? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and another way I think I can frame it is almost like an empowerment thing. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by empowerment, you know, it's not. I kind of look at society right now, and it's like this: this either focus on the individual, or focus on community. And I think there's space for absolutely both. But where authority or, or authoritarianism becomes out of balance is if we if we give away our our you know our power but also place responsibility on them because mm -hmm. that's ultimately very disempowering i'm a victim in this way or that way and again for me it's also not a political thing you know mm -hmm. it's just really looking at it and of course there will always be people who need help and assistance I'm not talking about that. I'm talking f about from an individual perspective or a perspective of a smaller community of growth coming and at some point kind of recognizing that, you know, there's a place for government and governance. But um, you know, it's also very disempowering. Government's the ultimate expression of it. But it can be guru, it can be shaman, it can be priest, it can be teacher. It can be mom or dad. Um, and so from that sense, yeah, it's not about becoming anti-authoritarian or anti-authority, but really just starting to realize that, you know, on a certain level energetically, there's, there's really something to be said about starting to own the experience as mine and take responsibility for my experience, that I'm also co-creator of it. You know, the way we talk about responsibility in this, I can, you know, there's almost a felt sense, I think, for many that feels heavy around it. That feels like it's the same kind of heaviness that exists around the word discipline for me. It feels like these high school words, you know. And I think, you know, the, the way I've always seen responsibility is the ability to respond authentically to whatever the situation brings. And so it's not about performance. It's not about doing it right or wrong. It's about starting to live our own authentic journey um, more and more. It's not about performing well, not ever making a mistake, because that, as far as I can see, is the mechanism of growth, you know. 
And so it's really just allowing ourselves to be human, but to be authentically human. And so no longer acting from programmed responses, if that makes sense. And so for me, it kind of goes deeper to a consciousness kind of understanding of it. We can bring it outside. You know, in a way, the outside is always a mirror of the inside for me. And sometimes I think the other way around too. Mm-hmm. I think mostly it, it gets driven by how we relate now and what kind of relationship we have with ourselves and the different aspects of ourselves. Mm-hmm. So for me, the plants have been extremely beautiful in that sense. And it's been a long journey, man. You know, every time you think, hey, I, I saw quite a bit of that. And sometimes I've, 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 been stupid enough to have the ideation of oh well I'm done with that then (laughs) just for a year later or whatever the time frame might be like oh wait here's plenty of deeper layers of that you know and so I think that true liberation from our own inner authority structures or power dynamics and protections uh, seems to be for some at least a quite a long journey and I think the external will kind of mirror that. You know, I don't think that we're going to sort this out in two or three years. Um, I think there's a much deeper level. First, it needs to be seen and acknowledged mm-hmm. by, um, I can't say how many people, but I think probably a majority of humanity needs to be able to see it and see what it is. Mm-hmm. You know, and realize that it's no one's fault. The system was created like that collectively. Of course, there might have been groups of powerful people who could have urged it on. You know, a lot of people believe that there's demiurges or dark forces external to us who are kind of keeping us trapped. I can't really answer that inquiry, but other than saying from a deep sense, it feels like even if that was so, once you reach a certain point of consciousness, it's not going to be able to keep us against our will. You know, I think human will is something that is quite sacrosanct mm-hmm. as part of this, of this experience. It would kind of be a bit of a shit show, no? Mm-hmm. If it were, we were just all doomed anyway. Mm-hmm. I think that also, you know, th- th- there's an aspect of this narrative for me where we can identify a group of people you know, and all we need to do is vanquish them and then everything will be better it falls into that hero's myth that journey mm-hmm. I like this story I'd love to believe it mm-hmm. I feel like it's harder than that because it's systemic and we all have not re- it's not our fault but we all have responsibility by bringing energy to that from our own dynamic inside of ourselves. Mm. There's a there's a YouTube channel I like a lot. I think the guy's name is Robert Zephyr. I think it's called Atlantean Gardens, maybe. But he's a he's an anthropologist, and uh, he was breaking down the the root of the word dragon, uh-huh. uh, the etymological root, and you know dragon or, or serpent, snake. I mean, these are classical archetypical symbols yeah. all over the world. I mean, yeah. in every tradition. And you mentioned that idea of the hero's journey. And mm-hmm. you know, one of the archetypical qualities of the hero's journey is is you know going into the cave and and slaying the dragon. Slaying the dragon. <laughs> um, and for so many people, you know, the dragon is the it's the it's the archetype of of everything that's evil, the fear, the mm-hmm. darkness. Mm-hmm. You know, even the cave. It's you know, there's no light and. But it was really fascinating because the the etymology of dragon is actually this idea of light. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And that it's almost the light being reflected of itself. So it's almost this idea, almost like the the image of a mirror. That's what the dragon is. It's Mm -hmm. the light reflecting back on itself. So the slaying of the dragon is actually looking at yourself and yeah. realizing that, that all of the evil that I was projecting out there is, is reflected back in. And, mm-hmm. and so it's the, it, it's the journey, it's the end goal, and yet it's also the archetype of the hero's journey is, is coming home too. Coming home, right? yeah. Um, I like that. So yeah, yeah, I found that really fascinating. And I think there's, you know, these archetypal and these myths exist because they're, 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 they're helping us 
to see truths in a in a non prescriptive way because of course each of us are kind of unique and so we have different ways of expressing that but yeah i certainly think you know the way i think of it you know from from a dual versus non dual perspective almost is that you know yes there is evil in the world and yes there might be forces influencing us but for me even if that's the case to have an experience of duality we need that we need balance mm -hmm. uh we need polarization mm -hmm. to experience separation duality and then growth in that to realize hey we've never actually been separate we're interconnected but we've been having this experience of what it would be like to be separate utterly separate mm -hmm. and so for me that you know that balance of dark light up down whatever that's the polarity of duality and so for me even the evil the dark the ugly the it has its function humans you know and that's for me the thing is owning the capacity inside of myself when i'm in total separation consciousness when i'm in fear when i'm in confusion that capacity to act from confusion and to act disgustingly mm. to beget more pain mm. in all sorts of twisted ways you know uh, over iterations of generations for it to get severely twisted pain begets more pain begets more pain cannot be resolved there's not enough consciousness there's not enough assistance there's not enough technology there's not enough whatever so over generations as humanity we've kind of built up this collection of nasties mm -hmm. you know for me it's like you have two adjacent rooms with a door in between one's pitch black one's got a light in it and you open the door between the two even just an inch what happens the dark light the dark room becomes much more light the room of the light doesn't dim mm. and so i think once we reach a certain threshold personally collectively doesn't matter how bad our sleepwalking got for me this whole period of humanity's development was almost like an incubation in a womb for me this feels like the initiation of a birthing into the true potential that we were created and so as a part of this right now our creations from fear from separation from pain all the twisted stuff that we've done collectively and individually is being brought to the light being brought to expression and that's tough you know you've lived in this room for 10 years and suddenly there's a bit of light and you realize it's fucking filthy there's cockroaches scurrying around there's rats everywhere there's you know it's not a nice recognition that I'm oh, home you know my room is filthy mm -hmm. you know but you know I, I, as far as i can see and what i feel and intuit is it's a, it's 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 the potential it's very necessary for us as co-creators even if a lot of these things might have been created unconsciously from fear it's not our fault but because we created them we need to acknowledge them and see them once yeah. Yeah. so that we can actually find the capacity of what it would be then to create from love and kindness i mean if if what we're suffering through right now is feels so powerful and it was done through illusory concepts imagine how powerful it's going to be if it's done through something that is more truthful inside of us right yeah so you you said you've been you've had your center now for seven years ten years i've had my center for the center where i'm at i've had for five and a bit years uh -huh. i've been serving medicine for the last almost eight years okay yeah so what would you say you know i'm sure you've worked with many people now what, what would you say are some of the we were talking about archetypes some of the common archetypes that yeah. people are, are coming for lots of depression and trauma mm -hmm. um probably one of the most common thing doesn't matter what it's paired with it can be all sorts of other things it's just a question of 
I want to know why I'm here. I want to know my purpose. I want to mm. figure out what it is, you know, people kind of feeling like they're doing something, they have a job, they might be, you know, studying even or across ages. People being like, I, you know, it's just a sense of there's, there's, there's deeper meaning here and it feels like I'm not living my potential or my purpose. You know, that might be manifesting as anxiety or depression and all sorts of kind of things. So, yeah, I'd say that and then trauma are the two main aspects that I'm, I'm, I tend to see and work with. Mm-hmm. And so when, when someone is taking Wachuma, how, from your experience, how are those things being resolved? Things like anxiety, depression, sense of purpose... Yeah, I mean, a lot of times they aren't getting resolved while they're there. No, it's a it's 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 a step in the direction of healing. Sometimes people find healing happening from the experience after integration. The mechanisms of it. Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, it's so varied for people. But I think the first the first most important thing is is what I alluded to in the beginning is saying completing expression. Mm. physical somatic expression of things that needed that and that kind of takes a lot of the tension and the contraction and it's almost like more of the space that is there kind of becomes activated and so you know again i know you i'm sure you you know work in a similar way it's this isn't like being done to people you know your participation is mm-hmm. absolutely required, mm-hmm. not necessarily in ceremony. You know, you bring intention and you show up and you try and allow. But then afterwards, you know, for me, what's so crucial that I'm seeing more and more is that this helps a person to shift something, create more space. But it feels so crucial for most to start living in an integrative way. So start generating some form of practice. I think a lot of people go home, integration starts happening, they start generating different uh, habits, different practices in their life, certain changes occur. And for me, the impetus for those changes is so much of the medicine because those changes also bring the integration. Mm. And so, you know, how the mechanism looks further down the line, I know how it looked for me. I have many, many people contacting me sometimes out of the blue months later saying, oh, you know, they were just thinking of me. They just wanted to send me this message, you know. By the way, that ceremony or that series of ceremonies was just life-changing when they look back at it now. Mm-hmm. Afterwards, they were like, I don't know what, you know, what to make of it. But down the line, so many, it's like a cascade. And I, You know, it's, I'm not claiming that the San Pedro or, or the ceremony at my place created all that but I think it's almost like that getting the ball rolling bringing Mm. some form of momentum Mm. then paired with an inner desire for something new different Mm. Um, I think it's taken further you know but I think really it's about unclogging the system Mm. of of things whose time has come to 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 be clear to be integrated to be removed Mm. So, you know, very often people come and they're ready there's a few things that they've kind of had a had an amount of time a good innings with but they just ain't able to step over it mm-hmm. and so it's right there and it's like Whoa. and then there's a few elements that need a little bit more acknowledging to, to bring it to the surface but, you know one of the main mechanisms for me I think is just really clearing up creating a capacity for space and a capacity for reframing of the narratives we've had towards ourselves rather than judging and blaming and looking at myself as somehow doing it wrong starting to understand the different aspects and their motivations for being the way they are starting to have the capacity to be more compassionate and kind to ourselves and then practice from that energy rather than I have to Mm. I'm very good example of that if I have to do something you can forget about it I don't do it but when I want to and I do it you know mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm very 
non-authoritarian in that way. Mm. Someone says to me, you will do this. Forget about it. <laughs> well, it seems like that's what a lot of the, you know, as you were saying, this work is really growing almost mm. exponentially. And there is, I mean, there, there's, a, there's really a tremendous amount of research going into to mm. this work now. Mm. Now, obviously, it, that's a bit complicated because you're, to some degree, potentially taking it out of context. And Sure, sure. But I think it's know. something that needs to be done. For sure. To become more acceptable for yeah. that, and then, you know, there's more space to play. You know? yeah. But it seems like one of the things that's really being pointed to is this idea of neurogenesis. Of, yeah. And, and that, that seems to kind of coincide with what you're saying with this ability, almost like a catalyst for change. Like yeah. something is, is clean, the old neuropathways, the, they're old or even dead maybe, but they're yeah. still running. Yeah. And that kind of through that cleansing or clearing something new a new possibility is open yeah. which is maybe why like the integration is so important to... also with most plant medicines there's a meta reframing there's a meta perspective that occurs you know the, the plants do modify our consciousness and we're in an altered state and so you know this with ayahuasca as well it's like and even with tobacco for me I, I get that it's like looking at at something that we've been sitting in or sitting with for such a long time and sometimes out of the blue we confront it with it in ceremony but because we're in such an expanded state of awareness suddenly we just see it from a completely different perspective mm -hmm. it's like oh you know I thought I was absolutely like this is it's like looking at it from up here it's like no it's it's really not what I thought that's powerful you know, I, I think a lot of coaching, mentoring, therapies, listening therapies ha are, are really geared towards that to help people um, have time to think and express and then they come to their own answers as they can just have time to put it out there. And this kind of does that same mechanism but not by talking, by really just bringing a, a framework of expanded time, space and complete different perspective on how we typically think about stuff we're not just coming to it with our frameworks from within it anymore we're just coming to it kind of from this more expanded view where we're perceiving it not just with our minds but with our hearts with our bodies and it's like it, it, it's, you just see it in such a different light from that perspective mm -hmm. and so that that disarms our narrative and our victimization narrative mm -hmm. as a result as well so that creates more space and options, mm. you know. So there's many mechanisms for me behind it, but these are the kind of ones that I can, you know, I can't even claim to know all the mechanisms that the, that the medicine's bringing. Mm. Uh, but these are the ones that I've kind of noticed and that I really want to say. So w what you were saying is, yeah, but it's that integration, it's the space, but it's also a complete change of perspective, mm. you know. That's a big idea, even because uh, I, I work with the Shpibo and their their word for ayahuasca is uni, mm -hmm. and it, it has this idea of, of wisdom, mm -hmm. and there I, I think in Buddhism, the panna I think is the the term for wisdom, and it's it has this idea of being able to see something from the other side. Mm. And, and that seems to be, at least for, from my experience, such a huge kind of revelation of, mm. of this plant work is, you know, just seeing something from the other side, there's mm. a release of that. It no longer carries that, that trauma, that weight, that, that charge, heaviness with yeah. the charge. Yeah. And, and often from that, something is arising like compassion or, or understanding, gratitude even, mm. which is such a different energy from, you know, Beating anger yourself up. or you know, <laughs> blame. And, yeah. Um, another thing, because you're working, I think you said in a ceremony, right? When, mm. when someone comes and they're, they're working with Wachuma, mm. uh, why do you think that ceremonial aspect is so important? Intention. Mm. Um, big part of my work is kind of more behind the scenes and if you will, I mean, in ceremony, I do my thing. 
but that's not something that I prepare for that I kind of can experience is something you've you've worked with the plant enough times you know you, you have your own insights and stuff but it's more like something that just shows up now it's not mentally kind of driven it's um state of flow state of grace however you want to call it um so for me a group of people coming together and you know the way i work is it's very prayer oriented it's very um i connect the spirit and pray a lot and put a lot of intention you know it's not coming from some religious ideation it's an experiential thing for me um but intent and shared intent. So everyone's coming together. You know, you've got eight or ten people there. My intent is to dedicate the space to what truth needs to be seen by each individual for their own healing development, seen or felt or cognized, whatever you want to put it. What what is needed for their healing what is appropriate for this juncture in time in which they find themselves. And so they each come with their intent to heal. It might be specific, it might be a bit more general. But everyone's coming with intent. And we're sitting in a circle and blowing tobacco. It's a sacred space that we're honoring. That we're, um, it's, it's sacred. It's a, it's a communion with self, with spirit, with Pachamama, with what is. And that intentionality to show up for that, you know, mm -hmm. as a group, together, um, for me just is such a powerful and such a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I mean, all, most shamanic guys start in a circle, and for me that's, that's the whole symbol of it. We're all here, mm -hmm. you know. And um, there's a shared intent, there's a shared desire, aspiration to, to grow, to heal. To come to more love and clarity, open heartedness, and um, we all drink together. And for me, that's really the power: is each person brings the medicine of their own willingness mm -hmm. to engage. You know, it's not always fun; it's not always pleasant. But everyone shows up, and they're like, "Yeah, this is what I desire." You know, mm -hmm. I aspire to more liberation, to more peace, to more love yeah I mean it seems like you know one of these other things that, that maybe we are or that has become out of balance is also this idea of a ceremony mm. um, and it seems like in many ways the, the, the way the world is moving with technology and things is, is, a, is a bit more leaning in the direction of isolation mm. you know now you don't even have to go to the movie theater which yeah. in, in a sense is a type of ceremony yeah. you're, you're with other people there's a yeah. felt sense of that energy and, um, and in so many cultures around the world you know the ceremony was huge you know and, and in, in, in many cultures there there are still a lot of ceremony yeah. it, it, you know I've, I've spent time in India and mm. you know there's so many ceremonies it seems mm. like there's a reason to celebrate almost anything and you know, there's a real charge in that. I think people, when they participate in the ceremony, they they feel something. I mean, it's mm. it's tangible, and it's um, you know, so maybe the the ceremonial aspect is is purely placebo. You know, as you were saying, but 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 even that. I mean, it, it seems like from anyone who's participated in the ceremony. I mean, even the work I do. You know, a, a huge part of of what people will describe as their healing process didn't, as you said, just come from the liquid that they're ingesting, mm. but the actual experience. And the experience is the maloka, the, the, the songs, the, the camaraderie, the, you know, the feeling of someone is suffering and, and then maybe I'm suffering. And, mm. you know, there's a mm. compassion, there, there's a camaraderie, there's a sense of hey, I'm actually not alone, mm. you know? And, and it seems like such a small thing, and yet, it, from my experience, it has a tremendous power. Um, mm. So with, with the ceremony, is, is that... How would you say... 
you know, because also it, it, it's a bit tricky because something with the ceremony is it's a very specific time and a place and an energy and it takes preparation. And yeah. So it's obviously not something we can do every day. No, it's not just a spontaneous right. occurrence. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say is kind of that balance of, you know, when is the time for a ceremony? When is the time to, to honor the ceremony of life? And, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, for individuals on a journey, maybe mm-hmm. too, you know, yeah. I don't think the time for ceremony is when you're when you're feeling cold, when you're feeling drawn to it, you know. Of course there needs to be some readiness. I do interview people as well because um there would be a few things. It's not about exclusivity, but just also making sure that it's appropriate and that it would actually be beneficial for the person themselves as well. Mm-hmm. The last thing I want to do is actually make them go backwards rather than going forwards. Um but yeah, feeling a calling, I think, is the first thing on a personal level. Um, and then working, yeah, you know, that's hard to define. I've had the experience of working with many people over long periods of time. It's people living close to me who live here. I'm going to go deeper with the plants. And... I can't really define it as an event or a specific thing that shows up. It's more a sense, you know. It's normally the person themselves will also kind of start realizing the way that the plant is, the way that the ceremony is unfolding and manifesting, and what it's bringing changes. It starts kind of symbolically showing to the person, okay, you know, your buffer is full, go, go integrate. <laughs> Sometimes people push through that. I'm not a big fan of that. But of course, each person... See, for me, the big difference between San Pedro and Ayahuasca, one of the big differences is that um, San Pedro, if you've done a few ceremonies and you, you feel it's easier then to work with it on your own. It's much more approachable. It's not as risky. Um, so a few people who've done a fair amount of work with me then do start doing self ceremony. Mm. And I've had the experience of quite a number of people kind of burning it too hard. Mm. I can't say that's wrong. You you learn your own lesson in that way. So mm. for me, you know, normally people will come for a set amount of time. So they choose. It can be a week, it can be two, three weeks, sometimes two months. And uh, if I have a sense of process, I'll rather reduce the frequency of ceremony. So I have my schedule, but I'll kind of recommend to the person to sit out every mm. second one, you know. Um, but yeah, I can't really talk about that too much from an observational perspective. It's more a feeling, a sense of, okay, you know, this is, this is good. The plant's given you what it can for now. It doesn't mean you're finished with it, but for now you need integration. Mm-hmm. You might feel after two months or six months or a year or two years that you're thinking about it again, it's showing up again, you might be dreaming about it, but it's time again to to go. Mm-hmm. Some people are like, should I stop with ayahuasca? And I'm like, why are you asking me? <laughs> what, are you, what, is, what is your intuition? So they're like, no, I'm not feeling ayahuasca. I'm like, okay, cool, so you don't drink it now. But that doesn't mean you should discard it forever. It might call you again, you know, at some point in the future. You never know. Yeah. Um, so if someone, if, you know, if someone has kind of that, that calling, they're, maybe they, they've heard of Wachuma, they're, they're interested, it, it, it's popping up more in their life, and they're at this point where they're like, okay, I, I think I want to come and work with this. What would you, what would you say to that person? Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I normally ask them what their intention would be, what it is that they want to work on, a bit of history. First thing's just on my website. And then if, you know, if someone wants to come for a single ceremony, I'll reach out. If they're coming from an ayahuasca retreat, very often people come from an ayahuasca retreat, they give their restrictions, time, mm-hmm. travel a little bit in Cusco. But they've heard it's good to drink San Pedro once after the, because it helps the ground and it helps the integration process along. And so... I know if someone's been at an ayahuasca center, let's say Temple of the Way of Light or one of the other ones, and you know, they, they I, I welcome them with open arms because they've probably already gone through a vigorous um, checking process, 
Also, for me, I'm not too worried about that because San Pedro isn't as risky or dangerous as ayahuasca typically is. You don't get the same kind of counter effects. Um, yeah, no, I, I normally welcome the person to come, you know. If I feel I have a good amount of information, the intention feels sound. I'm not super picky. There's a few red flags that I look out for. I'm not going to elaborate on that right now. Again, it's not a exclusivity thing or anything, it's really just around uh, making sure that it's appropriate for them, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that I will mention is I don't really like um, receiving people, this is not a judgment, but I just find that it really impacts the way the work can be received. I don't know if this is just my experience, but if someone has recently drank with like six or seven different people, mm-hmm. I normally don't like receiving them. Mm-hmm. Um, it just feels like there's, a, there's, there's so much muddled energy mm-hmm. that it's very hard to, to, to you know. Mm-hmm. Um, also, if people aren't willing to stop with other substances, so mm-hmm. let's make it marijuana or and mind tobacco and I have no judgment whatsoever against marijuana but for me if you're not willing to give a bit of space before, during and after then you know I, I just I just don't see how you could really be ready to receive the plant and its full potential mm-hmm. you know? it's an interesting thing because we, you know, from, from my experience in, in, in most of these traditions they're you know, again, going back to that word reverence, respect, mm. there, there was a reverence, respect for these plants and that there was a certain time and place mm. and, and there was, you know, there was a dedication. There was yeah. even a discipline of, yeah. okay, I'm going to cut these things out. I'm going to give myself this time. I'm really going to go into yeah. this. Uh, I do see more and more of of this kind of way of working, which is, you know, maybe someone comes down to Peru for two weeks and they're offered combo and ayahuasca yeah. and the next yeah. day San Pedro and the next day, uh, you know, who knows what. Uh, yeah. what, what, are your, what are your feelings on that? Because, you know, I think a lot of people, when they see that, if they haven't worked maybe yeah. with plants, that seems like a great idea. Like, yeah. oh, wow, I get to experience all of these. You know, yeah. that, I, I, should, I should come out even better. And, I'm, I'm not a fan at all. <laughs> more isn't more in this thing. Each of these medicines are phenomenal, no? Um, I get where a lot of people are coming from. You know, I'm not saying they're necessarily ignorant, but I think that a lot of people kind of... It's their first or maybe second foray into shamanism, into medicines. And they'd like to kind of get a taste of each one and also of different providers. So maybe they're thinking, well, you know, I'm going to be back next year and then I can choose one. Mm-hmm. But the effect of that, I've just what I've seen energetically in ceremony with people is depletion of energy, misalignment. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that any of the providers were not in integrity. And it definitely doesn't mean that the person's wrong or out of integrity either. But it just seems that when you're mixing lineages, when you're mixing medicines, frequencies... Um, it's kind of like trying to make a symphony with, with notes that don't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, resonate with one another. Mm. Um, it doesn't mean this note's bad and that one's good. It just means they're not resonant, you know. So you give time and place to each one separately. I don't have a problem. For me, it feels like there are certain medicines that pair well. Mm. So you know, when Al was still here, I find that. If someone has a period of time by me and they're doing some Pedro ceremonies, but it's not super frequently, they have six days having a tobacco ceremony in there for certain individuals, not for everyone. But with some people in ceremony, I'll be like, yeah, tobacco would be really good for you. you know? That resonates very well with some Pedro when called for. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wouldn't do it as a given in a retreat setting. But for those who would... It seems like it would be beneficial for yeah. You can feel it when someone's got a you know. Um, I think in certain circumstances as well. Also, if it's kind of doing an ayahuasca retreat, 
giving a little bit of space and then doing a few ceremonies with San Pedro or the other way around can have its own benefit as well. Mm. I believe the same could be with other combinations of medicine. I'm just talking about these that I've experienced, you know. Mm. So I'm definitely not saying you only need to do one thing. But I do, I hear what you're saying. It's like, okay, combo, tobacco, ayahuasca, mm. bufo, San Pedro. I'm not a fan of it. It's not coming from a purist perspective. It's coming from a pragmatic perspective. I've really seen anyone show up at me if I'm like the sixth place they're coming to where their energy is looking good at all. Mm. In fact, normally it looks pretty chaotic. Mm. And it's not bad. It, it, it'll recover. I just don't see why it's just unnecessary, mm. totally unnecessary. I, I interviewed uh, Sean in the last show. Uh, you know Sean, yeah. Sean yeah. he, he was he was talking about something, and you know it's interesting because a lot. I find a lot of times with this work, there's kind of this idea, this idea maybe of like spirituality, and that oh, yeah. spirituality is you know somewhere out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know that I'm 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 up in the clouds. Oh, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but what he was saying is often somehow overlooked, which is equally as important, probably more important, is this idea of groundedness. Oh yeah. And and that if anything, that's what these plants are really pointing us towards. Yeah. Is, you know, the sense yeah. of yeah. I'm I'm here. Yeah. I'm Absolutely. <laughs> you know, we've all had those experiences in ayahuasca, San Pedro, where it's like. Phew, that's in ceremony. It's saying, yeah, this is, this is. Mm. Okay, now, come, let's make space in here so this can come here, you know. Mm. And yeah, I do think, and I, again, I'm, it's, I'm not coming from a judgmental place where I think people are stupid. I, I, I believe I'm, every person unconsciously has their own. I do think some people are bypassing out of just plain old fear. Um, mm. That's a thing. Uh, I think all of us bypass at times or have bypassed at times whether we're conscious of it or not and bypassing is a part of humanity it's part of our protection sometimes I reckon but then you can get extreme bypassing and you know again not a judgment thing but I actually feel like a lot of providers are guilty of this you know whether it's like an economic thing or whether it's just I you know lack of presence or interest I don't know but Really, I think as a provider, it's, it, you, it is a certain place where you can actually say to someone, hey, you know what, man, this isn't wrong. I understand your intention, but hey, let me just talk to you about my experience and mm. what outcomes these tend to have, you know. Mm. Um, consider slowing down or sticking to one place for a while or just taking a break, you know. Because mm. when you start with a medicine, you just simply don't know. Very often there isn't that kind of guidance. Mm. So it's not like people are just being idiotic. You know, we come from a culture where, yeah, hey, you know, you're at this rave and then you go... Mm. <laughs> um, we binge watch movies till four in the morning. You know, it's, it's an it's a instant gratification kind of thing, you know. Mm. More is better. Mm. I'm going to get there quicker. I'm going to become enlightened by next Thursday. I just got to, you know, throw this as, as hard as I can. Um, and again it's almost like it's externalizing that responsibility at some point it's not a mistake necessarily at some point either you burn out or something happens or you're just too damn tired to continue and you go home or something happens you know but uh, sit with a hell of an integration because it's all out of the place <laughs> or maybe no integration at all because everything is just like this you know um you mentioned this idea, and, and I think it's, it's really interesting because you said <sighs> you're, the guy you studied with told you, you know, don't become a teacher. Yeah. Um, I didn't study with him. He was just a, oh, yeah, a, a yeah. friend of mine. A mentor yeah. of mine. Um, but this, it, it's this kind of fine balance because, uh, you know, also the, 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 the guy who I, I studied with mostly through tobacco, it, it's interesting because... Uh, I, th I think someone asked him, you know, are, are you a maestro? And he said, no, N no excepto esta palabra. Because <laughs> it's very deep voice. <laughs> and you know, he said, soy un guía. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, and, I like that. And, and many people would, would say, oh, no, you're, you're a curandero, you're yeah, a maestro. Yeah, yeah. I want to put you on the pedestal. Yeah. And he's just like, oh. Yeah. 
But, you know, with kind of talking about doing all of these different things, do you think that's where it is important to work with someone who, you know, maybe they're not a teacher, but they are a guide and they know, you know, how to take you down, how to bring you up, you know, how to say, hey, like, like slow down. This is Absolutely. I mean, until you reach a point where you feel really within yourself, like you've got a good enough relationship, you've got a good enough and more uh, resilient framework and a certain kind of maturity that you can do this responsibility on your own, you, you know. Then, by all means, you know, and I'm talking about San Pedro now, I'm not talking about the Mac or Ayahuasca, that's going to have its own thing. I can't really make a, a, a call on that. But initially, for sure, you know, I think also it depends on what people are working on, but... I find myself, I mean, I've been working with this plant for a long time now. I feel very comfortable with it. I trust it. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's not like my ceremonies when I drink for myself are comfortable, but in terms of its energy, its presence. But when I'm working on deep traumas, I still like having, whether it's my wife, she's a medicine person, or whether it's friends or colleagues of mine, I, I like drinking with someone because it does help me go deeper. It's not about the medicine, it's about the content that's arising and navigating it from within it. Sometimes just having someone there anchoring this holding space helps you to see it with more clarity. So no, I do think there's absolutely something about that. It's not about a teacher, and I don't mind if people call me a teacher. I don't see myself as a teacher, yeah? Also more akin to a guide. I'm a watcher man. I'm a guy who facilitates watcher man. I have experience with Wachuma. I have a very good relationship with it. And people can get benefit to work with me with it because they can connect with my connection modifying that a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so it's not for me at all, you know, this fear of ego, e- egotism. Uh, it, it's not an arrogant thing at all. I've, I've put in years with it and I know some things that other people don't. Uh, and it's not just knowing, it's also an energetic activation. Um, I don't feel like that's anything super special. Any, you know, there's many folks if they put in the same amount of work, they, they will in all likeliness be able to do the same thing. You know, um, but yeah, I do think, uh, especially around certain things like trauma, where a feeling of unsafety can arise, it's good to have a space that's prepared for it and someone that can hold space and that knows the framework of how this looks and can guide you through it, hold your hand, breathe with you, mm-hmm. talk, keep talk to you, help you to relax. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes do energetic movements, sometimes do other things if they appropriate and they show up in the pair in the in the time, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned uh, you said you, you did a dieta, was that with San Pedro? Yeah. So, so that's a, that's an option. Is one one can do ceremonial work with San Pedro, but one can also do a dieta. dieta. With San Pedro. Uh, yeah, I offer dietas as well. Okay. Um, initially, I'd hold dietas for people in this kind of separate space while there were other people doing normal work. Mm-hmm. They join in the ceremonies. They just wouldn't engage. We don't engage during ceremony, but after ceremony, fire mm-hmm. would be made. They'd go back to their room. Mm-hmm. So it's essentially Amazonian methodology. Yeah, three-week diet, uh, same dietary restrictions, uh, kind of isolation. Uh, and if, if someone isn't familiar with a dieta, what is what is that? What does that mean, or what does that entail? Yeah. So for me, I mean, there's two two energetic styles of it, and the one is kind of an apprentice diet. That's typically what people would use when they're becoming an ayahuasquero or a tabaquero to learn and ally and connect to the different plants and medicines. No? So you spend a predetermined amount of time in each lineage, there's different amounts of time that you drink this plant daily. And you do ceremonies either daily or twice a week or three times a week, depending on what system you're working with. And uh, in a way you're receiving healing, but you're also receiving alignment and activation and kind of of that medicine instilling itself for you but then you know for me the same is like where it's just a person wanting deeper healing mm. of course you're going to forge a deeper connection to that plant anyway um, but the outcome might not want uh, might not be 
any form of apprenticing or wanting to serve the medicine, really just deepening of healing. And so typically in the diets that I run, we'll do about six or seven ceremonies over three weeks. Mm. And uh, it'll be in silence. So it's like a silent retreat with very... um, uh, not limited food, but, you know, ingredients are constrained. So no salt, no excess herbs, no spices, very little fat. Mm-hmm. I find that San Pedro doesn't demand as strict a dieta as many of the other jungle plants do. Mm-hmm. You know, I can, I can give people a bit of fruit and things like that, not, nothing acidic, but and there's different ways. That's the way I run it. Mm-hmm. One of my friends does diets, she offers diets, and she gets the people to choose. This is when it's a healing connection diet. To choose how that looks. How many days do you want to diet? Do you want to drop salt? Do you want to be in isolation? You can go to Pisa. You decide. Mm-hmm. It's your choice. Sit with the plant and let it talk to you. Mm-hmm. I think there's something very beautiful about that too. Mm-hmm. I like this form of diet. Because we do it now that lately what we've been doing is we've been doing diet retreats. So I diet as well, and I've got four, four, four people dieting with me. Mm-hmm. And we all do it for, for four weeks, uh, three weeks. And what I really like about that, so everyone's kind of doing the same thing. But the whole space just becomes a completely different frequency, and it's beautiful work. Mm-hmm. I really love it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So if, if someone is interested in working with San Pedro, would you recommend they, they come down first and, and do a few ceremonies? Yes. Or? I wouldn't do a dieta with someone if they haven't uh, okay. worked with me. Or at least worked with someone that I know for mm-hmm. quite a number of ceremonies. Mm-hmm. It's not because it's hardcore or anything. It's just that you know, I, 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 don't, I don't feel like that kind of depth is necessarily called for immediately. You know, you can you can move a lot of stuff with just standard ceremonies uh, over a period of time. Come for a week or two or three and do a retreat, you know. Um, and then, you know, if you want to go deeper after that, for sure. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned uh, integration, and that's, that's kind of a, a, a big topic now, I think, yeah. with a lot of this work is... You know, people come and they maybe have these revelatory experiences. They yeah. go back and and then there's often this sense of, okay, now what? Now what? Yeah. Um, so you you one thing you said was you really recommend some sort of daily practice. Are there other other things mm-hmm. you would recommend to people, whether they've worked with San Pedro or maybe they've worked yeah, with yeah, other yeah. plant medicine? Yeah, practice I think is the key. It's it's just creating space and time. No, I mean if we go back to our old habits and we're up in the mind and tomorrow, yesterday concept world pretty much 24-7, where's the space mm-hmm. for these shifts and these seeds? It's not really, it's activations, but see it like a seed. You've got to tend the seed, you've got to water it, and, you know, for it to grow. And so how are we going to make space for these new aspects to grow, to mature inside of us, you know? So practice is firstly, for me, the key, and it's not necessarily activity-based stuff. Just being present, having a practice of listening for me is really key. Mm. And I normally say to people, look, if there's obvious stuff, your diet's been terrible. Make changes on that level. Mm. But don't make big changes immediately. Mm. Give yourself time to settle. I, I think what I want to come back to is what you said earlier about the plants want us to be here, mm. not out there. And so I think for me, whatever practice feels like, just having our feet on the ground having our feet on the ground, you know. When you sit on the grass for 20 minutes, go for a walk mm-hmm. next to the river, you know. If we can't do that kind of thing, then just, just sit for 10 minutes, just breathe. But you don't have to do a meditation practice, just be with yourself, you know. Mm-hmm. I think that's really so crucial. Obviously, there's the, the typical stuff that people ask, you know, continue having a cleaner diet. There might be certain things that they can't eat and so forth, but... Um, the more crucial one for me, of course, it depends, you know, with ayahuasca, with most plants, you don't want to kind of have a pork chop the next day. Um, but, uh, you know, the more important thing almost from an energetic perspective for me is really just finding whatever practice it is, uh, you know, that, that you feel like you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and start gentle. Start with 10 minutes a day then. 
oh, okay, I'm going to meditate for an hour a day. You do it twice. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so start, start small, but start with something that's sustainable. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, good. For me, it's not something you do, no? <coughs> mm-hmm. It's something that needs space and time. Mm-hmm. And so just kind of being aware of that. Right. Do you think that's that's maybe the most important thing to remember is integration? It, it just is something that needs space and time? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, I think across different methodologies and depending on the person and their process, there might be other appropriate things mm. that you might be sending them home with. Uh, including further ther- cognitive therapy, CBT, IFS, all these kinds of things. I find that for certain people having therapeutic integration afterwards is so, so important, you know? Mm. So, yeah, there's those kind of... If I'm talking about in the general, yeah, no, I'd really say that. For, for me, and especially with the San Pedro work, seems to be the thing. Yeah. One of my, my friends and colleagues, uh, you know her, Debbie, Yeah. Uh, she went... I think it was to the last World Ayahuasca Conference or something, um, and they they had a panel of of experts, and uh, they asked him this question, which was, um, "What are the plants trying to teach us?" Uh-huh. And she told me the answer that they kind of came to a consensus on, and I just kind of shook my head, like, "That's that's what the experts are pointing to." So. <laughs> I think it might be a question now that I ask uh, to people <laughs> to try and get, you know, uh, I think uh, from people who are actually, again, you know, really doing this work and, and on the mm-hmm. ground. So if, let's say you were sitting up in that conference and someone asked you, what what are these plans trying to teach us? Well, that's a big question. It's a big huh? question. <laughs> There's so many answers we can get to. Um, you know, aside from individual stuff, I... I guess the, the only answer I could really be satisfied with as a general is to be human, mm-hmm. fully human, and thus divine at the same time, but really to be human. Mm-hmm. That's for me, from the beginning, showing me my shit, showing me my trauma, showing me my illusion. None of this stuff was with an energy of judgment or punishment or... You know, of course, I'd hold judgment, and so it would feel judgmental. But when I look at it, you know, everything it was trying to show me that I'm just getting in the way, and if I can integrate and clear, and you know, align these aspects, heal these aspects, come to acceptance, then I can. It doesn't mean emotions don't show up anymore. Well, I'll never be angry again, or. I'll never be feeling any of the spectrum of emotions that we have. It just means that I don't judge myself for any of it anymore. I don't, mm. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm essentially not in opposition to reality anymore, to the reality of my expression and life and being. Mm. Um, so, yeah, for me it would be to, to be human fully, embrace that. Do you think there's there's some kind of felt sense that one is 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 kind of left with or more in touch with when one begins to stop that resistance to reality? Yeah. Sacredness, gratitude. Mm. It's the things we spoke about just now as well. I always kind of jokingly, but I said gratitude is 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 an emotional response when we're actually seeing our relationship to things more accurately. Mm when we're actually starting to realize the truth behind it. Mm-hmm. You can't help but be grateful, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah, so for me, gratitude, the a sense of the sacredness of life, that this is not just this random set of events and we're here and life's kind of happening to us, but this is actually one massive gift, one beautiful thing. And I, yes, of course it holds us challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what growth in this framework looks like. And it is an incredibly beautiful and sacred journey, mm. you know. So for me, that's the felt sense. When I'm really open and left afterwards, medicine has really done something, I've received it, it's impacted me. That's normally what I'm kind of left with. Mm. 
I'm talking about the day after ceremony. I feel a bit beat up <laughs> after that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Well, I mean, that, that was beautiful. We're we're almost at two hours. Um, is there is there anything else you you'd like to share or anything you'd like to impart or? No, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy. Oh. Yeah. If there's nothing else you want to explore, I, this is good. I, I think that's a great way to end it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been fun know, to it, have it, a chat. <laughs> absolutely. And it's uh, this, this is a nice podcast because for me, actually, I, I, I got to learn a lot, too. Because, yeah. you know, like I said, I... I've known of San Pedro for a while, but it's it's just not something I've I've taken the time to. Really yeah, and I mean, into. I realize I didn't go into too much depth with like its mechanisms and its effects, and I, you know, I kind of prefer not doing that because, mm. as you know, with any medicine, man, you know, you can talk about it, you can read about it, and then you go do ceremony, and it's, mm. you know, you can't really, you can't really talk about it. You can't. Uh, Actually, I think a lot of people prepare too much cognitively and then they get yeah. into it and then it's like, wait, wait, this doesn't match what I read in it, you know? Mm-hmm. Am I doing something wrong? And it's like, no, no, this is perfect, you know? So, yeah, I think if you know about it as a cactus, as a medicine, it's long duration, it works with emotions in the heart, something inside says to someone, hey, you know, I really... Maybe they've done it before, but maybe they haven't, and it's like, oh, it really, something feels very alluring. Good, go mm-hmm. explore, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, talking about its effects and it, literally what it does for people and during ceremony. And that's why, you know, I didn't go too deep for me, it was more about kind of how I sense yeah. that it works. Yeah, great. And if people want to get in touch with you through your website? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, my website is Ubuntu. U-B-U-N-T-U Aini A-Y-N-I dot com It's a melding of an African concept and an Andean concept because mm-hmm. a lot of the work we do has been informed by a lot of uh, by uh, Zulu shamanism we, we, we're not initiated into that tradition mm-hmm. but we've done ceremony with them and it just impacted us in such a deep way mm-hmm. a lot of our spiritual practice is informed by that our personal spiritual practice Mm. And so we like to kind of bring that intentionality, that work with spirit and that methodology to it. And so mm. for us, it's kind of like bridging our home and our connection to um, that way of connecting. Mm. Melded with the Andean because it's an Andean medicine. Mm. So we don't work with care or methodologies or anything like that, but it's an Andean medicine and we are in the Andes. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ubuntu, that has a similar meaning to Aini, no? It's... No, Aini is reciprocity. Uh-huh. So it's exchange between people and the way we bringing it in concept is like energetic exchange. Um, Ubuntu is... A Southern African, it's not South African exclusively, it's a Southern African concept or worldview of interconnectedness. Mm-hmm. And so you can't just say interconnectedness, it's actually much more broad than that. Um, it's kind of like um, we all suffer if, if someone suffers, you know, it's like it's, 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 it's interconnectedness that is beyond just like Oh, I'm I'm somehow in some abstract way connected to you. It's like mm-hmm. literally almost like a unity consciousness thing. It's a very beautiful concept when they're really working with it energetically. Mm-hmm. Um, very beautiful, very beautiful energy to it for me. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of the tribes were really living from that perspective, you know, in how they managed issues in the tribes and so forth as well just understanding that if someone did something wrong hurt someone or that it's not that individual that it's that something's not right in the tribe something's out of balance in the tribe that individual mm. is is expressing this is in its pure form i'm not saying mm. all tribes work this way but that that's this person was actually uh acting almost as a service to bring the symptom to to uh, to visibility you know that would kind of be the ultimate expression of a wound mm. yeah. oh, that's fascinating yeah. 
well, maybe we can uh, come back together and, and talk more about that. But uh, that's, that just piqued yeah. my interest. So yeah. yeah, cool stuff. Well, cool or not, I, I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yeah, Thank you. and uh, I, I look forward to to more. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Awesome. And and I'll put the, the, the website in the show notes and stuff Perfect. people. All right, everyone. So that's it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, I definitely enjoyed sitting down with Bernard. He's a, he's a really, really nice guy, really deep guy. And I, I really enjoyed that conversation. So um, that's it for this episode. Uh, as always, if you are able to um, subscribe to the show and if you're able to support in any way, uh, whether that's through Patreon or direct donation, Patreon is a really good format. Um, you can sign up. There's different tiers and really just for like $1 or $3 a month, you can help to support the show. And it has some really nice benefits where you get early access to shows, uh, bonus material, Q&As. So uh, there's there's a really nice reciprocity there, something that actually Bernard mentioned in, in even the name for his company, which is uh, Ubuntu Aini. And Aini is this concept of, of reciprocity, of of giving and receiving. So um, to all of you guys who have supported the show, I really appreciate it. Um, I have some good guests coming up. I'm not sure the exact order, um, but I have some some really good guests coming up. So I think these next uh, couple episodes are going to be uh, really nice. So stay tuned for that. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you guys, and I will see you soon.